right, good morning everyone and welcome to the Aperio Teaching and Learning Call for Wednesday, February the 6th. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia and I'll be facilitating this call which is going to focus on updates and conversation about the recent Sakai camp. I'm excited to see that we have some attendees on the call and I was not able to attend like many of you and so I'm excited to hear from those attendees and pepper them with questions about what's going on mm -hmm. and what they think about Sakai after the camp. So before we do that, let's take just a few minutes as we normally do to hear any project updates and announcements from any team reps that are on the call. I see that Wilma is signing in right now, and I know Wilma usually has a couple of announcements that she wants to share with the community. So Wilma, whenever you're ready, if you have some announcements, that would be great. Um, well, right now uh, we are gearing up for a release candidate one for Sakai 19. Hopefully that will be out uh, very shortly. Um, we're still waiting on a couple of issues to, to get resolved, um, but it looks like there may be a, a patch that gets pulled back so that we can go ahead and get the release out, um, hopefully this week or early next week. Um, so that should be in the works soon. Um, we had Sakai Camp last week, obviously, and so today we're going to be recapping some highlights from that. Um, and uh, the Open Aperio uh, call for proposals was extended. That is um, open through um, the end of this week, Friday the 8th. So if you've not put in a proposal for Open Aperio, I encourage you to do so. We still have a few days. Um, those are all the announcements I have right now. Awesome. Thank you, Wilma. I also saw some conversation earlier this week about the 2019 Atlas Awards, that the call for applications for Atlas is now open. And so I'm pasting a link to the call for applications page in the chat. Uh, note that you need to download the application no later than February 22nd, and you need to complete and submit that application no later than February the 26th. And there's all kinds of information there about what you need to do and what kinds of materials you can provide for Atlas. I know we typically don't have a huge number of instructors on this call, but we have a lot of people who work with instructors. And so you guys often know which faculty are doing really great work at your institutions that should be recognized. So feel free to take this link and throw it at everybody and uh, encourage them to submit their awesome ideas for the Atlas Awards for this year. Any other announcements before we dive into the main parts of our agenda for today? I don't think so. All right. Well, before we start discussing Sakai Camp, we had a request to talk about uh, teaching and learning JIRA that we got from Wilma earlier this week. So I'm going to paste a link to that JIRA in the chat. This is SAC 41231, uh, which affects the new minimum point value feature in the Samago Test and Quizzes tool. Some of you may have seen this feature or used this feature already. We've had some instructors here at UVA who have been very excited about it because it allows them uh, to, to apply some minimum point values automatically uh, to questions in the Samago Test and Quizzes tool, regardless of the correctness or incorrectness of the answers that are being submitted there. Uh, we've also had some requests for instructors who would like that minimum point value to be able to be equal to the point value of the question. And currently that's not possible. Uh, the minimum point value that you enter must be at least one one hundredth of a point less than the maximum point value for the question. But we've been kind of looking into this here. And so I know that Tiffany Stoll, who is our test and quizzes guru for the community, is on the call. So Tiffany, if you want to just talk about this JIRA a little bit and maybe give us an update on some of the things that we've been working on here at UVA, that would be great. Sure. Um, so this uh, feature, well, the issue with this I discovered in testing actually before we turned the feature on. It was, um, for, I think it was first put in to the general community code in Sakai 11. 
It's disabled by default, so uh, some of you may not have it on, uh, but if you're interested in it, it's just a property to enable it. Um, and, uh, and as Matt said, it allows instructors to set um, a certain amount of points so that if a student puts in any answer, and this includes for short answer essay questions, uh, there are a number of different types uh, that it affects, types of questions that it affects, I think five or six, uh, true, false, multiple choice, stuff like that, um, where you can set the, the amount of uh, minimum points you want students to get for submitting some content to that answer. And it's typically used for like participation questions or, um, you know, if, if you want students to do a sort of a check-in at the end of class, like this is what I learned today kind of stuff. Um, so that's what its its goal is. And uh, so instructors rightfully thought they could use this as a participation thing where, you know, anything the student types in for a short answer, they automatically get full credit for it. And before the instructor releases feedback for the assessment, they can go in and assign zeros to anyone who didn't uh, submit an adequate response. You know, instead of doing the other way around where they're typing like 60 zeros for all 60 students, <laughs> <laughs> who didn't submit a response, uh, they can they can allow them to all get credit for it uh, initially. So um, at UVA, uh, after a couple of instructors requested this, um, our developer David Hutchins worked on it and uh, I'm in the process of testing it. Uh, it tested out okay. Uh, I'm just trying to sort of work through some of the Samago general scoring testing because I like to give it a good workout uh, before I move any JIRA involving scoring forward. Uh, Samago is a pretty complex tool with lots of interactions of its many small parts. So um, I'm just working it out now and uh, hopefully it will be tested and move forward sometime in the next week or so. Thanks, Tiffany, for giving us that update. So it sounds like uh, UVA has been working on this feature and should have that ready to contribute back to the community for those who may not have used it and who might want to dive into it. Um, looking at you, Charles Bristow, you might want to check this feature out um, both before and after uh, we contribute this fix. So take a look at it and feel free um, to reach out to Tiffany uh, if you have any questions and uh, want to get any additional information uh, or to Alan Regan from Pepperdine, uh, who is also uh, involved in this feature. And as Laura Sierra points out in the chat, uh, Samago is in capable hands uh, with Tiffany, and that is definitely true. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, Wilma, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to also thank Tiffany for giving us a, a good update on that. Um, the reason I brought it up is that actually some of the folks at Pepperdine were asking about it. And um, and so I, I figured it would be a good item to bring up to this group to kind of let people know, because a lot of people, like Tiffany said, they don't even know that it exists. And, um, and I'm sure the Pepperdine uh, folks will be glad to hear that it's almost um, ready to, to be um, included so they can go ahead and, and start using it soon. So um, anyway, thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Wilma. I think I've been a little surprised uh, by the number of instructors that we've talked to uh, just this semester who've been excited about, you know, using this feature to do, you know, some basic participation and kind of extend their auto grading capabilities a little bit. So it's pretty cool and a little surprising even to me. So that's cool. Yeah, and um, just to add, there are a few other JIRAs out there about improving this uh, this feature. Uh, it was Pepperdine's originally, I believe, that uh, that they commissioned it to be created a while, quite a while ago. Um, I think they had it in production in 10 or something. Um, but anyway, uh, it's a, uh, a useful, nice feature, and um, we have quite a few people actually interested in it. Yeah, Charles points out that there are probably some instructors at Illinois State that would make use of this. And absolutely, I think a, a lot of instructors want uh, things that make their lives a little easier. And this is definitely one of those features. Absolutely. So I think we're ready to dive into our main Sakai camp discussion here. I'm excited to look through our 
that list and see that there are a number of people uh, in our list who attended Sakai camp um, and a number of people like me who may not have been able to attend or weren't able to attend the entire meeting. So, you know, I'm excited uh, to hear from some of you. Um, and maybe if uh, one or more of you would like to uh, come on the chat and maybe uh, give a couple of highlights for you, a couple of key takeaways um, about the conference, you know, that would be really great, especially for those of us who weren't able to be there. I see that Wilma has posted a link uh, to the notes for Sakai Camp in the chat. Thanks for doing that, Wilma. Um, and maybe Wilma, since you are our de facto community leader, if you want to kick us off uh, and start with a couple of highlights, one or two highlights for you, I think that would be great. Um, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so this year we did um, something a little bit different for the remote attendees. We did um, uh, a couple of, of designated times where we were broadcasting via Zoom and we used a, a piece of technology called the Meeting Owl, which is a 360 degree camera with a microphone and speaker built into it. Um, so I hope that that helped make the experience a little bit better for the folks attending remotely. Um, I know those of us in the room liked it quite a bit because the speaker picked up the audio really and broadcast it really nicely so we could hear the folks talking if they were um, connected via Zoom and talking to the, to the group. It was kind of like they were there. <laughs> and we even had actually a, a, a guest of, of guest spot by Neil. He joined at the end of the first day in Zoom and um, he had his camera on so he was kind of projected at the front of the room where the, uh, the big uh, projection screen was. So it's nice for everybody to, to get to see Neil and say hello and, and he's doing great. He's um, He's got a job uh, in open source and he's excited about what he's doing but he wanted to drop in and, and say hello to folks. Um, so it's good to see him. Um, in terms of content, I, I won't go too in-depth because I want to let other folks who were there talk, um, but the, the big takeaways for me um, in terms of content is that we talked a lot about web components and sort of making Sakai a little more modular. Um, so that these components would be reusable throughout the system. Things like um, rubrics is, is probably the first example of it. The rubrics code um, is a central uh, piece of code that is just called from any tool that uses it. So it's not kind of baked into all these other tools. It just sort of gets um, pulled in when needed from a, a central location. And so we want to extend that idea to a lot of other things that are duplicated and, and there's some redundancy. Um, things like grading, um, we talked about the centralized grading service. That would be another thing that would sort of centralize the functions in, in one location in the code and then could be called from different places to make things more consistent for the end user. And also, um, kind of streamline the code. Um, CK Editor is another one that has a lot of um, potential to be a web component that's used throughout the system and there's also a lot of really exciting um, things you can do in CK Editor 5 that we took some time to look at. Um, so those are probably for me anyway the standout items um, that we talked about uh, but there was a lot of stuff um, that we talked about throughout the you know two and a half days that we had together so um, I will let other folks jump in and um, talk about what they thought were their main takeaways. So Wilma I'd like to um, follow on to your mention of CK Editor. We actually are looking at CK Editor 5 and I just pasted a link to um, CK Editor's site <coughs> that has some demos of some really cool features and among them are um, inline editing. So you don't need to, um, the toolbar follows you as you edit. So that's super helpful so you don't have to do a lot of scrolling. Also document editing um, right in the editor without having to download the document first. Uh, and real-time collaboration um, within the editor. So I, find, I think these um, features are super exciting and are <clears throat> some of the more modern features that um, folks are experiencing in other LMSs. And I think the sooner we upgrade to CK Editor 5, um, the, the more we have to offer our users. So I'm super excited about that. 
So I'll, I'll follow on a, a little bit here. Um, I've been excited about CK Editor for a while. This came up, Earl offered some of these thoughts that he offered at uh, Sakai Camp at the Longside Retreat back in the fall. And so the idea of inline editing, the idea of document preview, uh, you know, by utilizing something that we already have better makes a lot of sense to me. So I was, I, I was pretty excited to see people react positively to it. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I don't remember what we thought the timeline might be on that. Does anybody else remember? So Charles asked about 19, about whether CK Editor 5 would be in 19. The answer is no, we were talking about 20. Yeah, okay. Okay. So looking forward to that. I mean, the other thing that stuck out for me was how ambitious the Sakai for 2020 straw man is, which I thought was really great. Um, you know, we need to set strong aspirational goals and, and strike out in favor of them. Um, well, not to not strike out exactly. We need to like, we need to pursue them strongly. Um, we, we started the conversation about institutional sponsorship, and I think that's a, a follow on conversation to have, you know, the uh, the dedicating the resources to make this stuff happen that we have set in our plan. But I think the, the first step is just to get the plan out there a little bit more broadly. Yeah, for sure. And another thing that we um, spent a little bit of time on, and, and Josh actually, actually sent out a survey, um, which some of you may have completed, and he sent it out to the email list about um, the manifesto, the Sakai manifesto, and sort of reevaluating that. Um, we developed it last year in Sakai Camp, and so sort of looking at it again and seeing, you know, you know, what did we actually um, accomplish along these lines? Um, it was a nice opportunity to kind of review our progress and um, and you know celebrate you know some of the things that we've done over the past year that um, kind of embody a lot of these principles. Uh, we also talked about getting a um, a task group together to develop um, a more comprehensive guiding principles document or statement for um, for the Sakai community because the manifesto is very focused on. Um, Sakai as software, but we thought that there's also a lot of other communities that have um, guiding principles for the community itself, um, not necessarily just the, the software that they produce. So, um, so we're going to be looking at that too. We'll probably see some um, calls for volunteers on along those lines. I'm posting a uh, link in the chat to last year's manifesto and to the um, the banner that was created uh, out of what we came up with last year. So the, the committee that was formed at Sakai Camp is going to be working on, um, on the next version of this pretty much because as a manifesto we agreed we should um, review it every year, make sure it still articulates where we want to go. And in this case we really thought um, who we are should be part of that. Two other things I'd offer. Uh, one is uh, the outcome of a pretty thoughtful conversation on Sakai marketing over lunch on day one. It was some of the most thoughtful feedback I think the marketing team has gotten from the largest group it's gotten it from. Um, in quite a while. So that was, that was pretty exciting to hear people really engaging. So there was, um, there was a document called the case for Sakai, which I've been starting to put together. That's going to form uh, the basis of some of the marketing that we do for Sakai when looking ahead to the release of Sakai for 2019. So I threw the, uh, the link in the chat and I uh, would welcome any comments there. I'll also toss out the revised three-year roadmap documents. We had a conversation about this in the context of the straw man for Sakai 20, and the roadmap was meant to address uh, 2020 through 2022. So there was, there was a fair bit of feedback and 
uh, one of my action items was to lightly revise the roadmap to accommodate the feedback, which I have done. So I will, I'll put that out there and people can take a look at that and comment on that as well. So one of the big things that we also talked about um, for a future release is a centralized grading service. And our next teaching and learning call on, well, two weeks from today, whatever that date is, um, I believe Wilma and some others at Longsite are going to be reviewing the proposal for that. And um, so it's in draft form now. Um, very exciting to think about having a central grading service that all tools use instead of each tool having its own grading service and working a little bit differently from other tools, um, having a centralized grading service will allow us to really streamline that functionality and possibly eventually create a um, something akin to a speed grader that um, is available in Canvas. So that, that's a very exciting project. Yeah, we're going to actually be using the um, the virtual conference funds to um, get that off the ground. I, it likely won't cover the entire project, but at least it'll be a start to sort of the first phase for that. But um, but we can talk about that more next time. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a very exciting project in the in the works. Yeah. We also um, talked quite a bit about uh, UI and, um, and UX and the Switch project. And for those of you who joined us remotely on um, Tuesday morning, we had a discussion about the, the pattern library. Um, and I, I see Jolie is on here. I don't know if she wants to, to speak to that. Yeah, I was just about to. <laughs> um, I think that was an exciting um, piece of the meeting for me, mainly because we've been working on that project, um, the Sakai UI improvement project for a couple of years now. And I think we're getting close to wrapping that up and creating a place where the authoritative Sakai UI library can live. Um, we moved a lot closer toward that um, at camp, making some decisions about how to move forward this spring. And I'm hoping by Open Aperio, we'll have something more concrete to share about that. Um, I'm also excited about CK Editor 5. Um, a lot of the things that other folks have talked about, um, guiding principles, um, but the UI piece I've been investing a lot of time in, and I was really glad to see that we made some decisions, con concrete decisions around that. We also scoped out 20, um, and so that you don't have to dig through um, all the notes, I'm gonna post the etherpad for that um, in the chat. We typically have that on a Confluence page, so if you're used to looking there for um, the scope of the next release. Um, it's actually not there right now unless one was taking care of that. Um, we, we put up an ether pad to scope that out. So it's in the chat. Did you see my question about the gradebook service? Uh, I wasn't sure if anyone on the call could say anything about whether that would be like a preliminary effort that could support um, real-time grade transmission back to the SIS? Yeah, I was just typing while, <laughs> while you were asking that. Um, we didn't scope it out initially, but I think that might be a really good thing to include in maybe a phase two of the project because um, having it centralized like that should, should facilitate those kinds of, of integrations. So um, definitely something to keep in mind as we scope out the, the second phase of the project. Right, and that, um, that explanation is one that our faculty can not only get behind, but um, if we don't give that to them eventually, we're gonna get them coming after us with pitchforks, <laughs> at least here at Notre Dame. I and I, I will say from the perspective of someone who's been responding to institutions that have been putting out uh, LMS RFPs, including some current Sakai institutions, they're asking for this. So it would it would behoove us to get this going once we have a, uh, um, a centralized grading service to work from. 
Duke is also interested in that. We've been talking about that for a while. Um, we've kind of put in an interim fix for how our how our grades get from Sakai to PeopleSoft, but it would be great to have something um, better than what we have. One thing that um, I don't know if we mentioned here on this call, but I know we talked about it at Sakai Camp, is one of the uh, really cool things about CK Editor 5 is there's document preview capability. Um, I know document preview is huge with, um, with folks that don't want to be uploading and downloading lots of files and want to be able to view um, student papers and such in the browser. Um, there's even some capability for uh, collaborative uh, work and uh, collaborative document ed editing in, in CK Editor 5. So we definitely want to explore those avenues and see how much of that we can leverage for Sakai. And we're seeing some comments in the chat that people are taking a look at the info for CK Editor 5 and they're loving it. And we have some comments from Charles that now you all are just tormenting us by talking about this new version of the editor that's not yet available. Um, and also some important comments from Tiffany that we'll need to test this in the accessibility working group, you know, as we rigorously test everything, which is one of the great things about Sakai. Um, I know you all have talked a little bit already about, you know, some things that will affect uh, the UI of Sakai 19 and Sakai 20 moving forward. And I obviously haven't had a chance to dive into some of these documents that have come out of Sakai camp yet. And I was wondering if you all uh, wanted to speak any more about, you know, some of uh, the plan changes or the ideal changes to the basic UI of Sakai, uh, whether that was discussed or whether you guys talked about that at all. I know that's the way that most basic users interact with any software product, including an LMS, is just through what it looks like um, and how everything looks and how everything works. And I know we've talked about that a little bit through CK Editor and through some of the things that Jolie has talked about. And I wondered if there was any more uh, discussion about that that any of you wanted to kind of chime in for us. I can talk about that. Um, the goal of the Sakai UI project, um, also known as Switch, which actually encompasses some other work done by Western to clean up Sakai's UI. Um, and they just need to highlight that work more. It's, they've done a lot of great work in terms of um, basic things that have been annoying in Sakai's UI for a while, like spacing and alignment. Um, and they've resolved a lot of those. Um, but our project was focused a little bit more on what Duke Web Services and I have been working on um, are UI inconsistencies, places where there's a discrepancy between buttons or other UI elements and how to define what we want the consistency to be, um, get consensus around that, um, put it in a single point of truth, a place where it can live and be referenced um, as the thing that you will use for that specific UI element or interaction. and then. Um, get those consistencies in place where they, where the inconsistencies exist, do the development work to actually make the um, UI more consistent based on those decisions. So we're trying to wrap up this piece where we're defining what the consistent elements are um, and getting it into that single point of truth, which could be a pattern library product, which is basically a place where these UI elements live and can be shown together. Um, they, they have different functionalities, but it's a, a place where it's a reference place. Um, and then, you know, the development work would be required to actually apply these consistencies. So um, we have a potential project at Duke this summer where we have um, eight or so students working 80, uh, 40 hours a week for eight weeks. Um, and we've put that project forward as something that we would like them to work on. So if we have this, you know, pattern library ready for the spring by summer when these students are available, um, we're hoping that they could make some progress toward that. So some of that work could get into 20. Um, I don't know if we'd be able to accomplish <clears throat> everything because I don't know the scope of that yet. But, um, but that's the goal. And there'll be plenty of work to do after that as well in terms of pr improving Sakai's usability. But I think that's a good step, at least making it more consistent for users.
That's awesome, Jolie. Thanks for that additional info. It's also exciting to hear, you know, that students are getting involved with Sakai and getting involved with Sakai development. I think that's a really cool feature, you know, something that we often talk about on these calls and elsewhere in the community is that Sakai, unlike some other corporate products, is an actual product of the educational environment, and that is its primary home. And so it's cool that not only instructional designers, not only developers, not only instructors, but also students are getting involved in charting its course for the future. And I think that's really cool. Josh, you mentioned that there were some good substantive discussions about marketing and you've posted some links to some documents in the chat. And I wondered if maybe you wanted to say a little bit more about that, if there were you know, particular things uh, that you thought were very helpful uh, that came out of those discussions, uh, some key points that maybe all of us should take away, whether we get to read through all these documents or not, anything that stood out for you there? Sure, glad to. Let me uh, let me dig up the notes and refer to them because that was one part of a fairly uh, extended series of, of days there. So we, we talked about marketing over lunch on the first day. <clears throat> and the first part was just sharing some of what marketing has been up to. So um, let me put the uh, the link to that specific section of the notes in the chat so people can take a look at that. Um, and yeah, flipping back to that now. So, so we, we, we talked about where we're at, which is this uh, some agreements that we have at this point about what we're doing and the kinds of messaging we're talking about. Um, you know, we're gonna market the product Sakai, not the product version to the world. We're gonna focus on shoring up the installed base, but be open to opportunistic expansion, continuing to focus on C-level deciders, which I suggested at Sakai Camp uh, is not just CIOs, but is also the faculty, staff, and students who serve on RFP review committees. So we're planning to stick with our current C-level messaging, uh, which and I shoved that in the, in the notes, Sakai is vibrant, Sakai is for leaders, Sakai is great software, the great UI, Sakai is energetically evolving and it's cloud ready. Um, we uh, we showed the SakaiLMS.org website for those. Who, hopefully, I'm assuming that most of you guys have seen it, but if you if you haven't, take a peek. Uh, we're soon to release a news section into that website. So we've got a couple of items written at this point. Uh, one about the work on Gradebook. Another about uh, the uh, the LTI 1.3 advances. And then my hope is to have a blog post or two, a news item or two written about what came out of Sakai Camp. So those are those are some of the things that are that are coming. And we also talked about the the case for Sakai. So a couple of a uh, couple of feedback pieces that I thought were interesting. And there was there's a discussion about whether to lead with uh, debunking the negative message or lead with a more positive message. And we've this has been a, a consistent discussion for the year and a half plus that I've been involved with marketing. You know, do we do we first want to counter the idea that Sakai is withering on the vine, or do we first want to be saying Sakai is amazing and not initially address the negative impressions that people might be carrying forward? So one of the pieces of feedback we got at Sakai Camp was go with the positive first. So the um, the case for Sakai has been adjusted along those lines. There was also the idea that we need to start having more of a Sakai presence at what people called large edu tech conferences. So uh, people talk about booths at Educause and ELI, and it turns out that Dr. Chuck is attempting to get into ELI. So that there may be discussion there to come. I think that the, the, best, the best way to play something like that would be for it to be a community booth, not necessarily a launch site booth. You know, then a lot of us can spend a little, each a little bit of time there. And there's the opportunity for you guys who work at higher ed institutions still, uh, unlike those of us who've gone over to the dark side, um, to be able to be at the booth and call over your friends and colleagues and say, hey, let me talk to you about this. Then it's a peer to peer conversation as opposed to a, a vendor to peer conversation. And there was also, so there, there was also the, the question of, you know, what would see, how would CIOs react? to the kinds of cases that we're putting out there. So anyone who would be willing to take uh, some of the, the current marketing materials to, to their CIO or to their senior director and get some feedback, I think that would be really valuable. Maybe also to faculty members who are interested in the concept of, of the LMS on campus. And the final piece uh, that really stuck out for me was 
the notion of what our elevator pitch is. Why would someone use Sakai over other LMSs? And it was interesting because that segmented into uh, top tier institutions and the rest of the institutions that may be facing more, uh, more uh, seriously the forces of constraint, as I call them. So I think that for most of the rest of us, the idea is Sakai is a great product at a really great price with, the, with a great ability to customize it. And uh, Dr. Chuck argued that for the top schools, the first message ought to be Sakai, Sakai allows you to be bold and to be in a position of leadership. And it's also a great product and it's also at a great cost. So that was that was kind of an interesting uh, moment of focus on audience that struck me. So let me let me pause there and see if, you know, Matt, whether that hit the mark or whether there are other questions or other things that we want to address from a marketing perspective. Thanks, Josh. I think that definitely hit the mark for me. I think that, you know, that gave some really great context about the discussions that you guys had. I really like um, the idea of focusing on and bringing different messages to, you know, different kinds of schools within the community. You know, I think that kind of targeted messaging can be really helpful and obviously a focus on leadership might be a more effective message uh, or a more important message for some schools rather than others who might have different needs and different concerns. And so I definitely like the idea of placing some of these many great things about Sakai in a particular context, you know, based on the particular institution or the particular audience that we're talking to. So I definitely really like that. Anybody else have thoughts or questions or comments um, about some of the stuff that Josh has just gone over here? One more thing, Josh, before we maybe move on to some other things, I know you've talked a lot about MISO survey data, uh, which is a survey that you've been involved in in the past and how that has helped you, you know, as you've worked on cases for Sakai and things like that. Um, I wonder if you could give us just a brief description of maybe how some of that has been helpful to you as you've been thinking about these more recent marketing things. Sure. Well, I've, uh... I've been talking about this data set for you know, maybe the last six or eight months at this point. Um, and I've been expanding my look at this data set. So initially there were, there were eight Sakai institutions that had done the MISO survey, which is uh, a survey of the effectiveness of IT and libraries in higher ed. It's been around since 05. There have been about 150 institutions that have participated. Round numbers, about 300,000 respondents, faculty, staff, and students. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly rich data set, and the comparisons we're able to make have ends, especially for students, in the tens of thousands, and ends for faculty in the thousands. And that doesn't uh, reflect the fact that faculty under-respond, they don't. Um, faculty actually respond in greater numbers than students, uh, but there are just fewer of them. You know, when you survey an institution, you might have, uh, you know, especially a smaller institution, you might have a couple hundred faculty members, whereas you might have a couple thousand students. So it's just, orders of magnitude. Uh, the More recently, around the time of the Sakai Virtual Conference, I got some analysis back on this data set that looked at Sakai schools, not just versus all others, but versus uh, Canvas schools in particular, and Moodle schools in particular, and Blackboard and others. So there's now the ability to do a very detailed comparison between Sakai institutions and institutions that run one particular other LMS. So I've really only just begun to tap that. The two points that I made in the case for Sakai, uh, one was that teaching outcomes for teaching technology writ large are better at Sakai adopting institutions. Um, I can't speak to why that is, um, but when you when you look at the case for Sakai and you look at it against other institutions, there's a there's a statistically significant and uh, very likely practically significant difference between Sakai institutions and those that run other LMSs. Uh, teaching technologies make a, make more of an impact for faculty teaching goals um, at these at our institutions, and I think that's something that we you know that's been really interesting for me. I think it's a great talking point for Sakai. I don't think we understand it well enough. I think that that's something to dig into and figure out you know what's really behind that and why that is and what that means. Uh, you know, th I've also looked at you know the notion of whether people would be happier if they switch to another LMS. And for sure, uh, you know, there will be individuals and maybe groups of individuals at institutions that switch that might be more satisfied 
with their with their next LMS than with than with Sakai or whatever LMS they switch from. But uh, one of the things that one of the other points that I've gathered from the MISO data is that really satisfaction among faculty and undergraduates is uh, you know largely the same across all of these all of these LMSs. So it's uh, you know it's uh, reasonably high satisfaction, although not top of the scale for all of these. And while there are some statistically significant differences between institutions that run different LMSs, there are different the differences are so small that I don't really consider them to be practically significant. So, uh, you know, I think the the message from a Sakai perspective is uh, faculty and students find Sakai faculty and student users of Sakai find it to be just as satisfactory as their peers at other institutions who use other LMSs. So there isn't a uh, a, a set of greener satisfaction grass over the fence there from switch. So it's good to be able to make that case as well. I, you know, I have a lot more that I want to dig into and I would welcome anyone who has interesting questions that they might want to ask of this data set. Not all questions can be answered, um, but a lot of them can. So, you know, I'd, I'd be, I'd be glad to, you know, hunker down with uh, anyone who's interested and have some deeper conversations. Anyway, ho hopefully that wasn't TMI. I, I love this stuff and it's uh, it's interesting and useful for us and there's more to be cleaned. Absolutely, Josh. I don't think that's TMI at all. I think in particular, you know, to be able to look at some actual data and say that, you know, based on this wide breadth of data that institutions using Sakai see better teaching outcomes is an incredibly powerful thing for, you know, people at the C-level, people sitting on RFP committees who are tasked with producing the best possible outcomes. I mean, you can't get much more relevant data than that. So I think to be able to have that kind of quantifiable data to put on websites, to put in RFPs, you know, to include in our messaging at the local institutional level is really powerful. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're all about is producing, you know, the best possible teaching outcomes uh, for all our people. If I could tack on one small piece, we have a second data set at our disposal, and that's the, uh, the the market data set that we purchased from the Infotech Research Group. So Neil was pushing for this when he was here, and you know Wilma Wilma led the charge. I just had the opportunity to to talk about it a little bit. Um, so on the website, you'll see a, a quadrant chart that shows leadership positions of the various LMSs, and that's actually data from August. This particular data is drawn from individual reviews of each LMS by folks who use it and choose to go to uh, softwarereviews.com, which is a, a service of the Infotech Research Group, uh, and actually submit a review. So Wilma has the link to submit more reviews, and I'd encourage folks to submit them. One of the things that's been interesting is as the number of Canvas reviews has increased, you know, ours has been around 50 to 60, increasing slowly since since July. But Canvas jumped from around 30 to around 60 reviews. And one of the things that was really interesting was in the in, in the leadership data, these are the overall composite scores uh, across all the features and all the, the what, what uh, Infotech calls the emotional footprint, the, the feeling about the LMS and how people view it. Uh, so in August, uh, Canvas was, Sakai, Canvas, and Moodle were the three markets market leaders. And that's that's a nice story in and of itself. Sakai is an acknowledged market leader according to independent research. Uh, but what happened in when, as the number of reviews went up for Canvas is that Canvas dropped back in position. So uh, Moodle now has a very slight leadership position over Canvas and Sakai, which are at parity. So we don't have uh, we don't have the license from Infotech at this moment to distribute that new quadrant that's going to come out in March with this inf with this new data. And uh, I'm in, Wilma and I are in negotiations with them to try and figure out, you know, what kind of a package they could offer us. They want to offer us a slightly bigger package than I think that we need. Um, you know, but I think that part of, uh, part of figuring out whether we want to spring for a bigger package, you know, whether it's slightly bigger than what we have now or significantly bigger uh, is the, uh, you know, is a conversation about the, the, the value of the results that we get. I actually think this is a great talking point, but I'd be really curious to hear from other folks what they think. And Wilma's also posted a link in the chat um, for community members to review Sakai, anticipating Tiffany's question. That's how good Wilma is. She reads your mind 
and post the link in the chat literally one second later. So feel free to check that out. Um, go to that link and review Sakai. It is definitely a mind meld over big blue button. That's exactly right, Josh. Laura Geckler, I know you've posted a couple of things in the chat, but you've been relatively quiet thus far, which is quite unusual for you. And I know that you were at Sakai camp. So uh, do you have a couple of points, a couple of takeaways that you want to share with us? <laughs> oh, I think folks have said it all. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, you saw my... Um, my link to the manifesto. I also found that there are people in the in the um, in this conference call who didn't bother to add their names to the etherpad. So I did it for you. You can thank me later. And uh, I also put the links to thank all you, those. Excuse me. I said thank you, Laura. I want to thank oh. you now. <laughs> Oh, okay. I also put the links to the um, the stuff we were sharing in the chat in the Etherpad because, um, you know, during a call like this, you don't really have time to go through it. But we've got some good stuff there for anyone who wants to be um, more deeply involved in Sakai going forward and what we all together are are doing with it. I think at this Sakai camp, and I hope at Open Aperio too, we will be doing some more higher level kinds of things um, in, uh, in managing the product uh, and the experience for our faculty and putting together resources to, um, to uh, I don't know, establish our dream team here. You know, some of us have been around the block quite a few times and we kind of get sort of into the same old, same old um, mindset, not realizing that uh, every few years, even as a standing community, we kind of go through these refresh cycles where we um, catch a new glimmer of what we are together and what we can do together, um, pooling all our resources. And that's kind of my takeaway from Sakai Camp was um, in terms of the roadmap, in terms of um, some of the things we do year round, like uh, I made a point of thanking Jolie, and I'll do it again here um, on this call for taking leadership of the QA process and making it open and inviting and um, a small barrier to entry for anyone who hasn't done it before. Um, she's consistent, she's tracking, she's amazing. Um, and marketing, having Josh um, as the new kid on the block with Longsight and really taking a big bite out of who we are and what language do we use with different audiences and what uh, channels exist, like a real marketing person, that's pretty cool. Um, and of course, you know um, that I'm especially pas passionate about the Sakai Manifesto as being kind of a, um, um, a creed, maybe, <laughs> for, those, for those of you who have some kind of a, um, you know, spiritual or religious background, there's a creed that ev that everybody knows that they they can recite together. And I think with all these documents and all this writing that we kind of need to boil it down so any one of us can say, yeah, this is what we're about and this is what's going on in our community. So yeah, Josh said it there, uh, manifesto and roadmap is a powerful statement. So, And an elevator pitch. Yes, that's that's the word I was looking for. Creed popped out, but elevator pitch works. Okay, Matt Burgess, there was my 15 seconds in the sun. Thank you for the offer. That was beautiful as always, Laura. Thank you very much. That's exactly why I called on you. Anybody else who was at Sakai Camp who's got some thoughts that they'd like to share or folks who listened in to some of the virtual sessions or folks who weren't able to attend? Um, if you have any questions, feel free to come on the mic or post them in the chat. I saw a comment from Dave Evelyn in the chat that he's so excited about where Sakai is headed as much or more as he's ever been. And that's 
very exciting, something that I think a lot of people usually feel when they come out of meetings like this, which speaks to uh, the ingenuity and the creativity in the community, uh, which is really exciting. Dave mentions that he came into one of the virtual sessions and it worked well. Um, kudos to Wilma for the owl mic. And I agree, I got to be a part of one virtual session at the very end of the conference. And I also thought um, the audio visual worked really well. Uh, it was nice to be able to see uh, everybody or almost everybody. It was nice to be able to hear everybody. Um, and that was really cool um, to be able to participate virtually um, while we were trapped up here in the frigid north. And Josh has a question in the chat about um, the current state of uh, LTI.3. Maybe before we do that, Charles, if you've got something, uh, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, I was also just going to chime in about being able to participate remotely. Um, I thought it was uh, a really nice opportunity. Um, I agree it, it worked pretty well. Um, the only thing I had problems with, the, the sound was a little bit iffy uh, at times, and I couldn't see anybody's name things that were little name placards so I wasn't sure who quite everybody was um, but that's a minor quibble yeah this the sound was interesting I mean, we, were, we were learning about the meeting owl as we went uh, the the table was in uh, a U shape and the meeting owl was in the middle so the people who were on the sides of the U closest to the meeting owl the sound was great uh, the people who were on the deep part of the U, the sound was a little bit not as great if they weren't really speaking up. That was what I noticed from being in the hallway trying to check out the the remote side. So we've got we've got some learning to do, but it was I, I was pretty impressed at how well it picked up most of what was in the room. I didn't I didn't think it was going to work anywhere near as well as it did. Yeah, it was kind of an experiment, so I'm glad it worked as well as it did. And and if we use it again next year, we'll try to position it a little bit um, better so that it picks up um, folks that are kind of down at, at one end a little bit more. Um, but uh, I would like just to take a, um, a moment to invite folks who didn't attend to think about going next year. Um, it's always a lot of fun. It's always a great group of really engaged people. And, um, you know, we do fun stuff too. This year, unfortunately, the weather didn't cooperate very well. So it, it, it was rainy and cold all day Sunday when we usually do our, our team building activities. So a lot of folks were uh, opted out of the soggy theme parks <laughs> but um but hopefully next year it won't be um that's that tends to be unusual for florida so um so hopefully there'll be a lot of, of good opportunities and we all we have the group dinners and there's a lot of networking and socializing so it's always a lot of fun and you really get to know um the folks who attend so i, I highly encourage anybody who's interested and can make it away um you know in january usually it's at the end of january um to uh, to think about attending next year and that was a question from Dave Evelyn in the chat, Wilma, was if dates have been set for next year. Maybe not at this point, but it's normally in mid to late January. Is that right? Yeah, it's usually, um, you know, we wait. We don't do it too early in January because people are still coming back from the break and getting into their classes. And then there's usually like Martin Luther King holiday in there. And, you know, we don't want to... Um, compete with with too many other things so it tends to be late january um and the the hotel rates are a little bit cheaper at that time of year as well so um, we haven't set the specific dates but that's kind of the time frame that we would shoot for um and it will be at the probably most likely um we haven't made a, a 100% decision, but everybody that attended seemed pretty happy with the new location. So there's a good chance we'll be back there again um, next year, which was, uh, it was a holiday in Disney Springs, um, and it's walking distance to Disney Springs, which has like a whole bunch of restaurants and shops and, you know, theaters and, you know, activities and stuff to do. So, um, so it was a pretty good location. And uh, the hotel setup um, seemed to work pretty nice. The meeting room was nice. It was convenient. Um, the food service and everything was good. So um, high probability that we'll go back. Cool. 
And I see that Josh is asking in the chat about how many people might have come if they could have found additional travel funds. Um, and I know that some people are responding now in the chat. I can speak for some of us here at UVA and say that we would have loved to have come and been a bigger part, but unfortunately the beginning of the school year is kind of a difficult time uh, for us since we do a lot of tier one and tier two support with instructors. That first couple of weeks of the semester is is hard for us. And I don't know if that's true uh, for anybody else, but we were really glad that uh, Trisha and Nathan Piazza, our UI UX developer could be there. Um, and lead the charge um, on the Cavaliers behalf. Josh, it's 1056, but we might have just one or two minutes to say something briefly about LTI 1.3. Um, if you want to say something briefly about that, I think that'd be great. Sure, I'll try and be quick. So we, we heard a lot from uh, from Dr. Chuck about LTI 1.3. He is uh, he's working on the inside uh, to try and push the LTI standard forward at IMS. And so he said a couple of things. Uh, one is that uh, LTI 1.3 is about to be adopted by the four major uh, by the four major LMSs. He doesn't know why D2L isn't, but uh, Sakai, Moodle, Canvas, and Blackboard are all about to adopt the certification. And lo and behold, we saw a press release many of us did yesterday or the day before saying that this had happened. So that's pretty good. He went so far as to say that the only LMSs that will be relevant in two years will be those that support LTI 1.3. So that's that's kind of interesting. Um, he also was of the opinion that LTI 1.3 would begin to erase over the next year to two the advantage that Moodle and Canvas have developed in the app store that they have that, that each one has put together. Uh, you know, Moodle's got plugins and Canvas has an app store. And, you know, Chuck thought that that advantage would be eroded uh, because all of those products would have to switch over to LTI 1.3. Uh, they can't they can't stay in there in their current mode of integration, which actually bodes really well for Sakai. Um, yeah, and that's I, I, I think I think I'll leave it at that. Wilma, um, Laura, do you guys think that there are other things that uh, that ought to be said about LTI 1.3? Um, there will probably be a press release shortly. Um, there was one that IMS Global put out that named Sakai, uh, Blackboard, Moodle, and Canvas as uh, LTI Advantage certified. And LTI Advantage is, is probably the term that you'll hear more often than LTI 1.3, even though it's essentially the same thing. Um, but uh, so that that announcement has gone out and we'll be uh, we'll be putting together a Sakai specific press release to kind of follow on to that. And there's some really cool um, tweets on Twitter. Um, Dave Evelyn uh, mentions uh, Blackboard had a had a tweet they put out about um, their certification and um, and I went ahead and uh, welcomed them to it on behalf of Sakai. <laughs> so if any of you have Twitter accounts, it would be really great if you'd jump on those things and like them and retweet them and, um, you know, just uh, keep mentioning Sakai in, um, in relationship with the LTI Advantage uh, standard and our work with IMS Global to put that forward and um, those other big name people with whom we have this in common. And it not just in common, but um, actually, you know, we can say stuff about uh, being a front runner. And this is definitely a great place to be a front runner in terms of interoperability and being able to plug in new tools and new services. It doesn't get much better than that. So that is a really cool thing for us to have leadership in. Okay, it is 1059. So I think it is about time for us to wrap up for today. Thanks, everybody for a wonderful and wide ranging discussion. It was great to hear from all of you. I feel like I was almost there. Um, plus, I missed the rain in all the lines at Disney World. So I'm glad to hear about all the exciting things that you guys talked about and uh, all the things uh, that came out of this always great meeting. Uh, please feel free, everybody to return to the etherpad and check Check out the links uh, to the various notes and manifestos and cases uh, that are all linked there. Um, note that we will be right back here in two weeks on Wednesday, February the 20th at 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, where Wilma Hodges and Earl Neitzel from Longsight are going to talk about 
this new proposal for a centralized grade service in Sakai. Uh, so please uh, be right here with us in two weeks for that. Um, note that currently our meetings on March 6th and March the 20th do not have topics. Um, so if you have interesting things that are going on in your school, things uh, that you want to share, things that you want to learn more about, um, please feel free to reach out to Wilma or Tricia or myself. Um, our emails are all right there on the teaching and learning confluence page. Let us know about those or else we will be coming for you. Uh, many of you know uh, to expect emails from me uh, looking for topics, trolling for topics. So uh, we will be looking for you. So we will look forward to seeing all of you right back here in two weeks. Thanks for a great discussion and we'll see you on the 20th.